Thank you, and uh, uh, glad you could all join us. And it's a privilege to be here speaking to you about this, uh, about this project. Um, we've all seen these uh, iconic images, uh, heart-rending images. Um, some would be instantly recognizable, others less so. Uh, from different countries, disparate locations, you can see the desperation on people's faces. You can see the incredible odds that they lived through to get from point A to point B. You can see sort of heart-rending um, desire to know where they're going to be and how they're going to survive. Uh, you can see dilapidated existences in the destinations that they end up in. Um, really, it's, it's a reminder on a daily basis on the front pages of newspapers that we should all be doing much better. Uh, the genesis of this session came about when we realized that a lot of people were thinking about how to use technology to address some of these problems. And I'm going to do something a little bit unusual. I'm going to take you back to the largest instance of involuntary migration in recorded human history, which actually happened 70 years ago today when British India was partitioned in 1947. So my agenda here is not so much to tell you about the partition of British India, which resulted in almost 20 million people having to uproot themselves, including both my mother and my father, um, and a lot of people who I know today uh, uh, still have memories of those, of those partitions. But my agenda is for you to think a little bit about the interaction between technology and what we can learn from these historical episodes that might be relevant today. And I'm going to submit to you that even though epochal events like the partition of British India, which continues to reverberate in political senses today between India and Pakistan, two nuclear states, uh, even though these are so important and have been studied by scores and scores, maybe hundreds of scholars, uh, I think that we've taken a rather limited view uh, of how to study these things. I'm going to suggest to you that technology can play a role and tell us something about what people might be going through today. So that's my agenda, really. Um, the 1947 partition, <coughs> partition of British India can't hear it. is a signal event in humanitarian forced migration. It's the largest episode of forced migration from war, disaster, or crisis that we have yet ever seen or documented. It is a very big and complicated problem uh, because we have different languages, different governments, um, a fair amount of emotion on both sides still. And it's really important to get the voices of scholars from India, Pakistan, and hopefully from Bangladesh as we pursue this to give us an overall idea of what really happened. By the humanitarian consequences, of partition. I'm speaking about the narrow window of 19, late 1946 through 1948 to ask what did they do along the way to help people while they were moving. But the points that I'm looking at in addition to the actual travel support are how did the refugee camps and the resettlement camps <clears throat> actually manage to take care of hundreds of thousands and at some points millions of people. What's fascinating to me is that this is an untold story that speaks to the humanity of Pakistan and India, government and local people, and it speaks to the resilience and sheer grit of the refugees. So ultimately, uh, what we are hoping with the SAI Partition Project is that it will be a documentary uh, site for the entire span of British India during this period, and it will have oral interviews as well as a mass an enormous number of documents that at the moment are not easy to find uh, or retrieve. So this is my colleague Jennifer Leaning, one of the most compassionate people I know. She's a medical doctor, professor at Harvard Medical School, uh, and she and I are leading a very interdisciplinary collection of scholars who are really looking at this partition event using technology. Um, what she talked about was a project that I like to think of as crowdsourcing memory. Uh, in other words, this is an event that happened so long ago, uh, and our, our problem, my scholarly problem with the way it's been studied is that we have limited ourselves to very, very limited archives. Probably the archives are primarily written by uh, people who have a certain disciplinary angle, uh, maybe an ax to grind, as is inevitably the case with scholarship and history. It's written, as we always know, by the victor, so to speak, and we'd like to take a fresh look at it. The challenge, of course, is that we're running out of time because people who were alive, like my parents, during the partition are now in their late 70s to late 80s, and there's not that much time. So that's what we've been trying to do. Here's what we've done. Um, 
just to give you a sense, this is, of course, India, uh, Pakistan, and Bangladesh. At partition in 1947, uh, broke into West Pakistan and East Pakistan. And of course, the country that we now know of is India. This is a little bit of a heat map showing uh, where in and outbound migration occurred. And the number that I'll alert you to, which we'll come back to later on, is 17.9 million. This number is an estimate reached by different people in our research community and is vastly greater than the estimates that you find in recorded texts in Britain or in other places. Um, the recorded, recorded text numbers are probably more in the, on, in the range of three to four million or something like that. So it's really quite, quite disproportionately larger. Uh, what we've done is uh, create, recruit, I'm just gonna show you the results of a small pilot, though the actual effort is much larger. We have so-called 33 ambassadors who have gone out and used technology, basically the handheld devices that you're carrying around, created a set of protocols, trained them in so-called institutional re review board uh, uh, protocols so that you make sure that you do this compassionately and ethically, and gone out and encouraged people to speak into whatever device they want for defined periods of time in a semi-structured way. And our task using technology is both to make this incredibly democratic and get these inputs from, I hope, several thousands of people in the next uh, few months from all over the world, and then use semantic analysis, uh, uh, all sorts of other techniques that you have to parse through both the spoken, spoken records of people as well as the text analysis of people to rethink different things. And what I'll show you is just a small uh, sample of the sorts of things that we can find out, even with a very small pilot of 300 stories. Uh, these, are, these are the stories that we have right now, about 300 of them. Um, what you'll see here is the migration routes, which are the official routes, and you'll see it sort of emerging here. It's basically from uh, Karachi to Mumbai, which is one big mi migration path, and from Lahore to Delhi. A lot of it is by rail. Uh, these were very famously memorialized uh, migration routes with a lot of killing and mayhem along the way. Though interestingly, uh, Jennifer's research is showing that there was also a lot of humanitarianism uh, demonstrated during this, which isn't really recorded in the text. It's a small example of how uh, things were done in compassionate ways. Uh, from the crowdsourced data, we were able to find really a much more bewildering richness to the kinds of routes and paths that people took. And I've just plotted up here a sample of these, these white dotted lines that you can see are much more complicated. Lots of places of multiple stops, a lot of refugee camps along the way. You can accumulate statistics on what happened in these camps, what people's experiences were, which are directly relevant to, to the kinds of situations that you see uh, today. So there was a time that in our house, there were 40 families. They had adopted um, a Muslim boy who was an orphan. The, that boy had grown up in our grandparents' home. 15th August 1947, that night, was a crucial night. We remained there for some time. Then the camp commander was there. We got in touch with him. That we can't get in. He said, "Up for another place. You can have no food." No friction. No difference. In the Hindus went to Muslims. And Muslims came to Hindu houses. We could never imagine that we will journey to college, we will go to a degree, we will go to a degree. And so, so things happened. These are actual voices of survivors of partition. One of those voices is my father's, just reflecting on how in the house that our family created, we had almost 40 or 50 families staying with us for untold numbers of months as a humanitarian gesture. But what I like about this crowdsourcing project is that you hear the actual voices, you can preserve them from memory, you can analyze them, you can hear the emotion, different languages. Uh, you can hear that some people's recollections are bitter, uh, you can hear that some people's re recollections have come to terms with a difficult par uh, part of their, of their own lived experiences. Uh, and interestingly, those in our data seem to, be correlate, seem to correlate with different outcomes today, even ha having to do with their families. So it's interesting what, what sorts of stuff pops up from it. Uh, here's just a snapshot of some simple data. Um, one of the things with crowdsourcing information like this in societies that have been traditionally dominated by males is that you want to worry about whether you're getting the voices of the women, because it's a very different perspective. So we've gone out of our way to make sure we get it. Not entirely successful, but not bad. At least a third of our respondents are women and improving as time passes, and you get very different perspectives from them. Uh, this is just a little histogram uh, uh, showing, uh, showing the average age at the time of migration. Uh, somebody could not have been 40 at 
70 years ago, because they'd be 110 today, so that must be a second generation memory of somebody that's being recorded. 90% uh, of our respondents migrated, 9% choosing to stay where they were and deal with the mayhem. 40% of those who migrated stayed in camps, and then we have all sorts of data on what actually happens in the camps that if anybody's interested, I'll, I'll share with you offline. Um, we're able to find camps through our oral stories, the actual locations of the camps. The iconic ones amongst these have been studied, but we were able to uncover things that are new refugee camps, or that we think are new refugee camps, and go in and begin to study them just by aggregating the oral responses of this. And all I'm showing you again are just 300 responses. Imagine what, what we would do if we had 30,000, which I'm pretty sure we'll be able to do pretty soon. Um, this is what happened, just blowing up little places. In, this is the city of New Delhi and the camps within it. Um, again, an image in the 1950s of what New Delhi might have looked like, showing an actual Kingsway camp. Um, and one, one, other, one other sort of very nice thing is that we were able to, there should be another image here. Uh, we are able to do things like, so we have in our, in our uh, respondents, we have a tailor somebody who is an 82-year-old tailor who remembers his occupation, uh, how he was forced to move away from one country to the other, from what was one country to another one, how he stayed in this particular camp. And he's uploaded into our platform images, things like this, like a scissor, which is memorabilia. And one of the things that I hope will come out of this is a collection not only of uh, data of the sort that I, as an applied mathematician, would quantify and do statistical analysis and this and that on, but also the lived experiences of individuals, because that's what gives you the human touch, along with the emotion and the voice and the inflection and so on and so forth. Um, those are the stories we have right now. Our target, uh, uh, using a collection of academics in different countries, is to maybe get to 3,000 by the end of the month, by the end of the year. Uh, and frankly, I think we should be able to do much better than that and hopefully learn something about what actually happens in refugee camps and in the migrations, forced migrations that happen. But my point really here was to illustrate that um, uh, as we see so much uh, migration occurring, much of it involuntary around the world, this is a simulation I think from Carnegie Mellon that I'm borrowing here. Um, remember that the numbers that we see today, uh, this is just one epochal event right, that happened that was fairly large. So there really is a lot to learn from this. And if we go back to crowdsourcing people's memories, maybe there's something we can add to the scholarly record and inform the policy dialogue uh, as we go along. So I'll stop with that and hand over to, uh, to, uh, to David, who will tell us about RefUnite, because there are a number of themes that are in common. That's David. True. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm David, I'm the co-founder of RefUnite, together with that guy on your right, which is my brother Christopher. Um, I love when I see that picture, uh, most of all because this is really what started RefUnite to begin with. Um, the boy you see up there on your left is Mansoor, and we got in contact to him roughly 10 years ago in Copenhagen. and. Um, became really good friends, and after a while, he told us his story how he had fled the Taliban out of um, Afghanistan back in 2001. And during his escape, he actually lost all contact to his family. And fast forward these five, six years uh, until we met him in Copenhagen, and, and he still had no idea if his family was even alive. And to us, that was a, a bit of a surprise, you know. Um, First of all, we thought, how hard can it be to find your family? Uh, this is 2006, it's a really connected world, and we knew very little about the situation of refugees. So we, we, we told him, you know what, you're alive, maybe the rest of your family is alive, why don't we try to find them? And that turned out to be uh, quite a journey. It, uh, it actually ended up taking us nine months where we went through uh, a host of refugee organizations, of course, that were very helpful, but in the end, we had to go back to Peshawar, Pakistan, where he had last seen his, uh, his siblings, and got in contact with uh, one of the human traffickers that had helped them out back then. And really through sheer serendipity, he uh, remembered Mansoor and Mansoor's story, and um, also where he had sent one of his brothers, uh, which is Pawan up to your right, 
Now, Pawan, unfortunately, ended up in south of Russia, in Stavropol, and was really, uh, it was pure human trafficking, and he was, he was working there as a slave. But a very long story short, um, three months later, we actually got them reconnected in Moscow, and, um, and that, was, that was a game changer for me and my brother, for sure. You know, seeing two brothers that are in any, any, in any way just like us, you know, someone that really cares for, for their loved ones um, and for their family, uh, finally see each other again and realizing that, that, that you had hope again because you had family. Um, and through this whole ordeal, uh, two things really came to our mind. One was that we had met literally hundreds, if not thousands, of refugees in the exact same situation. They had lost contact with their family. They didn't know where they were. And the other thing we discovered, um, to our surprise really, was that in all of this, there was no technology involved. Um, back then, it was a pen and paper family tracing. Uh, and even though a lot of refugees, of course, didn't have access to technology, they still had um, access to a very simple phone in many cases where you could send SMS and text messages and so on. So um, what we really thought of back then was, why isn't there a Google for refugees, if you like? So we created the first online family tracing platform that then evolved into um, a great partnership with Ericsson that um, developed the first platform, which was purely SMS-based. So you could create a profile via SMS, and then we could, of course, uh, match the data we got from p different profiles and then, and then reconnect people that way. Um, a little bit more about what Refunite is. Um, the second part we, we, we added was, was uh, enabling USSD. USSD is very well known in Central and East Africa because this is the way that you top up your credit on your phone, for instance. So most refugees can be guided through the whole registration process via USSD and makes it a little easier and less cumbersome uh, than SMS. The third part is, of course, that um, we knew that at some point smartphones would also play a very big role from refugees, because even in Dadaab and Kakuma, where we've been most present in, Nairobi, or in Kenya, we're still seeing up to 40, 45% that have access, or either direct or indirect access to a smartphone. So we're seeing a lot of registrations coming through our m.refunite.org platform. And then last but not least, we have had quite success with our call centers because, of course, in areas, in many refugee areas, uh, we, see, we see literacy up to 90%. So, so most people won't be able to create a profile on their own. They will often get help, but the call center was really a game changer, uh, especially in Somalia, for instance, because people could call up and give out the information um, to, to our call center. Um, this is really where we're present now. Uh, although we're a global uh, entity because we, we're online, so wherever you can, you can go on right here, but, but this is where we have mobile partnerships in, in, in Asia, in, 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 in Africa, and Europe that provides these services that I just explained before, uh, free of charge for refugees in most cases. So they uh, have access to our platform, um, and we can also disseminate, uh, disseminate information uh, through the mobile operator. So we can target areas like a refugee camp or a um, an area with large uh, population of refugees in, in urban settings, for instance, and, and send out information about our services to them directly. This is just one of. Uh, thousands of reconnections that we made today, um, but I still love it because it really shows the power of technology. These two sisters got separated now 20 some odd years ago and um, had no idea where each other were for all those years. And when they got on our platform, they realized that they were both within five mile radius of Nairobi. They've been living in the same city so close to each other without being able to find each other for so many years. So that was a wonderful story. Um, now, we really find the mobile phone to be the most 
democratic and empowering tool that at least the refugee, but even the world has ever seen. This is to us a game changer. And of course, through the experience of working with all the aid agencies and the mobile operators over the last 10 years, we have also figured out that, or we've also seen that the service that we provide in terms of family tracing can definitely be replicated in many other areas. Um, so uh, we have now just created and, 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 and built uh, our newest edition called RefuNet. And RefuNet is based on mesh technology. That means that um, this is Bluetooth local social enabled networks where refugees are able to actually share data um, in refugee settings, whether it's in a camp or it's, a, again, in an urban refugee area where there's enough phones, they do not need any uh, mobile connectivity. Because the biggest challenge for refugees is not getting connected anymore, it's that they cannot afford data. They really cannot afford the data. Uh, so this, we think, will be a very, very interesting addition to our services. Um, because not only can we provide family tracing this way, uh, but we see that, um, that there's other potentials as well. Um, IVR is another um, area that we are very focused on right now. Um, this is something that works well if, if, uh, if it's in English for now, but as soon as you get down to, to other languages and dialects, it gets quite complicated, but uh, we're still we're still trying it out and probably will fail a lot, but let's see how it goes for the next year or two here. We got a pilot project going in, in uh, Pakistan right now. Anyways, back to, to, to RefuNet as we call it. Uh, the, 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 the way that they are able to communicate not just with each other in a refugee camp through this their new uh, mesh network platform, uh, but it's also a way for us to offer many other services for refugees because, of course, family tracing is just a small component of, of, of the needs they have. So other humanitarian agencies can then send out information um, to, to refugees about anything from health to, to food distribution to, to uh, education to how to get remittance and so on and so forth. Um, and this is one way where it can work. An aid agency sends out, pushes out an information. The responder, which is a refugee in this case, can, can get back to you with saying a, a question like, so how much rice will there be today? And we can answer that, uh, that it's one kilo in this case here. Um, we really, really think that this will be a very, very interesting addition to, to Refunite because uh, you know, mesh technology is quite old, but the fact that we can now create mesh technology that does not need nodes, does not need um, nodes, meaning that you do not have to have any hardware installed, because that was the problem before. If you, if you added hardware to any refugee setting, it would be there for maybe 10 minutes, if you're lucky a day, and then it'll be stolen and gone. But here it is really phone-to-phone um, -phone connectivity. Um, so, of course, you won't get instant updates if you're 15 phones away, but within 10, 15 minutes latest, someone will have reached your phone. So, um, very excited about that. I will leave it with a short uh, story of another reconnection, and um, here we go. It was morning. I was out fetching water, water for my family, like I do every day. And then I heard the guns. I heard my family scream, cry for help, my help. But the soldiers were everywhere. I saw everything. I ran. I ran for my life. I don't know where, but I got away. Found a place to hide.
I was safe, but what about my family? Something told me they were still alive. So I went back. I had to. For them. But they were gone. I had no home. No family. There was no one to help me. Estelle never gave up hope. And in 2012, she heard about Refugees United, a mobile platform that helps reconnect loved ones separated by conflict or disaster. Shortly after signing up, Estelle received an SMS from Refugees United with a message from her long-lost sister. Using the platform, the girls exchanged phone numbers and found that after 16 years of separation, they were living only five kilometers from each other. The sisters continued to use the Refugees United platform in hope of finding other members of their family. Today, there are over 43 million refugees worldwide, many with stories just like Estelle's. Help us to reconnect them with their loved ones by sharing this film. Learn more on our website.